guys, it's Chelsea from The Financial Diet, and this week's video is sponsored by Saks Off Fifth. And thanks to Saks Off Fifth for supporting TFD. Shop now at SaksOffFifth.com or go to a Saks Off Fifth store near you for up to 70% off spring styles. We talk a lot on this channel about the ways to feel rich in your day-to-day -day life and how often it is not connected to the exact dollar amount in your bank account. And one of the ways to really feel rich on a day-to-day -day basis is to be super intentional with the purchases you make and focus on long-term quality and cost per use over just buying whatever happens to be cheapest. And here at TFD, we believe that building your wardrobe isn't something you have to be rich for. Saks Off Fifth makes luxury fashion accessible for anyone, and they are cultivating an inclusive world of self-expression. I'm always looking for affordable investment pieces and staples for my wardrobe. And while we're in the month of March scouring for spring trends, Saks Off Fifth has a great selection of floral dresses, matching blazer and skirt sets, colorful suiting, and statement puff sleeves. Plus, Saks Off Fifth lets you shop your favorite designer brands for up to 70% off every day, from brands like Alice and Olivia, Veronica Beard, Remy Brooke, and more. Saks Off Fifth gives you access to luxury fashion at an incredible value and shopping experience. Shop now at SaksOffFifth.com or go to a Saks Off Fifth store near you for up to 70% off spring styles. Saks Off Fifth, where fashion takes off. And we have the Oscars coming up this Sunday, which is in my opinion, a perfect excuse for me to talk about some movies that I absolutely love. And before I get into my list, just a reminder that we do have a once monthly members only video. And this past month's was all about uh, the myth of meritocracy and Nepo babies and um, kind of the insidious backstory of how the Oscars are even decided. Um, it's just kind of a breakdown on how the Oscars are both a result of and also feed into our really messed up cultural narratives about meritocracy and who deserves success. Um, I highly recommend it. I love that video. Um, it's gonna be linked in in the description, but you can also just click the join button and you get access to that video as well as all of our other members only videos and all other kinds of bonuses like our book club, my office hours, um, and tons of other goodies. So join us at the society. Now, often when we talk about movies and television, we're talking about a representation of class and money and especially things like poverty or the working class that is inaccurate at best. I recently had a conversation on the Financial Confessions with fellow YouTuber Princess Weeks all about how often pop culture misses the mark when it comes to representation on these issues. And it's often the case that movies that do represent these issues accurately are shut out of things like the Oscars, which we'll get into a little bit more when we talk about some of these movies. But I wanted to take this opportunity to highlight 10 of my personal favorite movies when it comes to the representation of poverty, the working class, and class issues more generally. This list is not exhaustive and I am by no means a movie expert, so I'm sure there will be plenty of omissions here. And I'd love to hear in the comments some of your favorites and why you love them so much. But for now, I wanna get into my personal top 10 best movies in no particular order that represent these issues magnificently. And this will be spoiler free, so don't worry if you haven't seen them. I wanna start this list off with my probably top, like one of my top five movies of all time um, and my personal favorite movie on the topic of the poor and working class in America, which is The Florida Project by Sean Baker. So I am a massive fan of Sean Baker's work. I think all of his movies are really worth watching. Um, but to me, The Florida Project is probably his masterpiece so far, um, both in terms of the visual language of the movie. I think in terms of cinematography, it captures childhood in a way I've almost never seen a movie do before. Um, but the way it represents poverty um, and marginalized economic communities is something that I think so many movies miss the mark on. The Florida Project is primarily seen through the eyes of uh, the six-year-old character Mooney, who is living with her mother in a motel in Florida just outside of Disney World. Interestingly, the movie is often actually shot from her visual point of view, so a lot of times the camera work is very low to the ground and you're not seeing adults' faces, and um, you really sort of feel immersed in Mooney's experience. And I won't give spoilers, but I think the two things that the movie accomplishes so beautifully from a class and economic perspective is A, neither demonizing nor sort of idealizing the poor in this country. This movie follows people who live on the margins of society, who are living out of a motel, um, who are always on the cusp of homelessness, and it shows them as being full 360 human beings who are neither perfect nor terrible. 
Often in pop culture, we really tend to view the poor through one of two lenses. They're either these magical creatures who are spiritually perfect or they're demons who deserve to be in their position because of their own failing moral character. But this movie does a really, really fabulous job of showing that all of these people are just people. They're flawed. Sometimes they make frustrating bad decisions, but sometimes they do everything right and they can't get ahead. Which brings me to the other thing that I think this movie does masterfully, which is really demonstrate the vicious cycle of poverty. Most of the people in this movie who are living in this motel and therefore again on the verge of not having a place to live are working, they have jobs. And although on paper they might have all of the ingredients to have more stable housing, there are so many roadblocks in this country to actually getting into a home and being able to keep it. For example, if you don't already have a good credit score, if you don't have enough saved up for a deposit, first, last, and security, if you're being paid under the table and can't provide pay stubs, or you just got your job and don't have enough of a payment history. And it really demonstrates, in addition to the cycle of poverty, just how much being unhoused is such a gray area. It's not a black or white issue, and often many people who are experiencing it are experiencing it at many different levels of severity at any given time. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of these movies are typically shut out at the Oscars, and for me, The Florida Project is one of the most egregious examples. The only person nominated was Willem Dafoe, who was one of the only recognizable figures in the movie. A lot of the people um, who are in this movie were not actors before, which is something Sean Baker does a lot in his movies, and Willem Dafoe didn't win, but it was also the only nomination which I thought was catastrophic, because at least cinematography, I would argue best director. Um, but point being, this movie did not get nearly the reception that I think it deserved. Um, and if I have one mission in life, it's to make sure everyone watches it. Number two is I, Daniel Blake. Now, Ken Loach is the director of this movie, and Ken Loach to me is one of the all-time best working directors we have right now, representing the poor and working class, representing labor issues, representing things like marginalized community, disability, um, impossible to navigate programs. Basically, the movie follows the character Daniel Blake, who suffers a medical issue and isn't able to work as he has to fight to, for example, receive the benefits that he needs to live. Now, this does take place in England, so the system is somewhat different than the one that we have in the US, but all of these patterns are very much the same. And the way the Florida Project represents the cycle of poverty, I really think that I, Daniel Blake, represents how much government programs for things like disability are themselves a vicious cycle, where you're often punished for being too able-bodied and then punished for not being able-bodied enough. You're punished for not having enough money, then you're punished for having too much of it. This movie is one that really connects with you so viscerally in the sense that as you're watching Daniel go through his appeal processes and the struggle to access the benefit he needs, you really feel that intense frustration and you live kind of the highs and lows along with him, which I think is rarely accurately portrayed in movies, although other movies do uh, do it quite well as well that I'll get to later in the list. But on this topic specifically, I would also recommend checking out our episode of The Financial Confessions with Imani Barbarin, aka Crutches and Spice, who talks all about navigating the disability disability programs here in the United States. Um, and it is obviously a similarly frustrating experience, but I do think it's something really worth learning about because although many of us watching this may not today ourselves be disabled, a huge number of us, especially as we age, will become so. And it's so important to be aware of these systems, be active for advocating for better programs and better policies, even when we're not necessarily participating in them ourselves yet. On a slightly less depressing note from I, Daniel Blake, which I do admit is a bummer of a movie, but an excellent one, is ATL. Now, this is a movie that came out in 2006. It stars the rapper T.I. and the actress Lauren London. And this was actually directed by Chris Robinson, who is also a music video director. And you really see in this movie the very sort of like dynamic, frenetic, musically influenced kind of vibe of his direction, which I think makes for a lot of the more heavy subjects in this movie um, it gives it a level of accessibility and entertainment that a lot of these movies don't have. Um, I think a lot of times when we're addressing class issues in movies and television, we're often doing so through a pretty serious tone. And again, this is why a movie like The Florida Project is something that really resonates with me because the childhood vision of it all really kind of adds a level of fun and levity and escapism. But ATL also does that really, really well. In this case, it follows adolescents, people who are just finishing high school, a group of friends uh, in Atlanta. And the kind of fun, frenetic, musically driven tone of the movie kind of acts as like a gateway into what are ultimately much more serious economic issues. This whole movie really centers around class dynamics, 
especially between the main couple featured in the movie who come from two very different class backgrounds and I won't spoil it but often engage in a lot of kind of um, posturing and in some cases outright lying in order to seem from a different class. It also shows the ways in which these families can be stuck in cycles of things like poverty and crime and violence, and how in order to escape a lot of these systems, you have to sort of pretend to be a different person and fake it until you make it, as with, for example, some of the characters who are aspiring to go to more elite schools and enter into elite professional spaces. To me, ATL is one of my favorite movies that has a true like pop culture level of entertainment entertainment and flashiness, but has a real level of substance and meaning to its class representation that I think often gets totally overlooked in teen movies. Now we're going to get depressing again. There's just no way to avoid it. Manchester by the Sea, directed by Kenneth Lonergan. So Manchester by the Sea is another one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, I know that is probably somewhat controversial because Casey Affleck seems like a bad dude and I like don't want to give him credit for this, but he did unfortunately freak it with this movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, Michelle Williams is on screen for like 10 minutes, but it's like one of the most affecting performances I've ever seen. Everyone in that movie. Also, my husband Kyle Chandler is prominently featured in this movie, so it was just like, it's a win for me. Um, but this movie is actually less on its surface about money and class and poverty um, because it is primarily about grief and trauma and family bonds and addiction and things like that. Um, but what it does really, really powerfully that I think few movies really do is show how much money and class really interrupt and complicate the grieving process. Um, for example, when someone dies or when someone is uh, struggling with addiction or mental illness, like in theory, that should just be a time where you're able to focus on mental health and healing and recovery. But for many people, things like a death will automatically just mean an enormous logistical headache, debt, expenses you can't afford, and all kinds of confusing and cumbersome bureaucratic processes that you don't know how to navigate. And Casey Affleck's character in this movie is someone who is pretty working class and has to deal with a lot of issues that are pretty seriously complicated by that class status and by that lack of financial privilege. The scenes, for example, speaking to lawyers and having to call out of work and having to balance needing to make a paycheck versus needing to be there for loved ones, I think is something that we don't often see in movies that deal with these big traumatic subjects because it's a lot messier to talk about the logistics behind it than it is to talk about the raw human emotion. But this movie does both in what is, in my opinion, a really, really masterful way. Next up is Roma, um, directed by Alfonso Cuaron. Um, it's a Spanish language movie set in Mexico City in the neighborhood of Roma uh, in the 1970s. Um, and it mostly follows the indigenous nanny of a fairly well-off kind of upper middle class couple living in Mexico City. And one thing that it does, I think, really, really, really well, aside from sort of showing uh, the inherent class and socioeconomic dynamics that also fall along racial lines, again, because of the fact that our main character is indigenous, while the family that she's working for reads as more clearly of European descent. The movie also shows the really interesting place that domestic workers exist in in a lot of these families, especially people like nannies. As I mentioned before on this channel, I was a nanny for wealthy families for many years and it is really remarkable how often these particular domestic workers, um, maids, nannies, cooks, etc., will almost become like a surrogate family member, but they are often still really limited in the extent to which they can really participate in the family or advocate for themselves or maintain healthy professional boundaries because of that different class dynamic. The main character that we follow in this movie does end up assuming a kind of quasi-familial role, but we're always reminded of the fact that she is inherently different and separate from this family. And in many ways, the kind of pressures that we put on domestic workers are ones that really meet that true definition of emotional labor, i.e. having to give of yourself emotionally just to be considered as meeting the minimum of your job, even if you're performing all of the actual tasks to satisfaction. This movie is also just beautiful, it's moving, it's very humane and emotional. Um, so I recommend it on all those levels, but particularly as a representation of domestic workers, um, I think it's really, really fascinating. On a similar note is Parasite, directed by Bong Joon-ho. Now, I think we can all agree that um, there was a real vibe shift. Uh, Parasite won Best Picture in 2020, and then God was like, that's enough good things for now. 
a pandemic. Um, it was like the last good thing that happened before everything went to sh uh, But in all seriousness, I think for a lot of people, the fact that Parasite won Best Picture was an immense shock because movies like this generally don't win Best Picture, right? Like not only is it a foreign language film, there's like no white people in the movie, which is shocking for a Best Picture at the Oscar. It takes place in a totally different culture, obviously. It's set in South Korea. But it also deals with class issues in a way that centers the poorer of the people being depicted, which is fairly rare in a lot of these prestige movies. Parasite has a lot of parallels to Roma in the sense that you're looking at the relationship between the workers who are tasked with serving these very wealthy families and sort of live parallel to the families. And obviously in the movie, which I won't spoil, uh, this sort of starts to manifest in all kinds of crazy and ever heightening ways as the Parasite family basically, you know, they start doing some scams, I'll say. But it's interesting how, although the poorer family in this movie is obviously presented as doing duplicitous things, lying, cheating, stealing, etc., as the viewer, you're pretty much on their side the whole time. And I think this is really because the movie very effectively represents the extent to which domestic workers and workers that serve these very wealthy families, these very wealthy individuals, are so heavily sidelined and dehumanized in the process of doing this work. The White Lotus is a TV show that demonstrates this really well as well. Um, but in these elite spaces, these workers are often basically all but forced to strip themselves of humanity and to become totally subservient and invisible to the people that they work for. I think a lot of us remember the scene where uh, one of the main characters is driving around the woman he works for and this man is just at the very end of his ropes, has suffered like all kinds of unimaginable traumas. And she's just sitting in the back seat with her smelly ass feet propped up next to him, like babbling away on the cell phone. And you're like, swerve off a cliff and kill this like you truly feel that visceral rage of being dehumanized and marginalized in every possible capacity in the process of working for these people. Um, it really took me back to my days of working at like a country club. Um, and yeah, I could go on for days about that. But suffice to say, um, this movie does a fantastic job at representing class dynamics in a way that I think rarely gets portrayed in movies this well. On the sadder side again, unfortunately, we're going to take it to Precious, directed by Lee Daniels. Now, this movie is another one that truly was a bit of an upset at the Oscars because Monique did win Best Actress for her role in this movie, which was pretty unexpected. And again, these types of roles and frankly, these types of actors are not generally rewarded at ceremonies like this. But I personally believe that she absolutely deserved it. I actually did a video on the channel a few years ago all about Monique and kind of the bull that she's had to deal with in this industry. But this movie, which basically follows the story of a teenage girl who is suffering all kinds of abuse and failure by all kinds of systems around her, um, really demonstrates not only the obvious and you know visceral trauma of the actual abuse that she's going through, but the ways in which children and adolescents like this can totally fall through the cracks of the systems that are meant to protect them. There's a lot of portrayals in this movie of various government programs, various workers who are meant to help or to provide resources to Precious. And you often see how time after time, very few of these people and services actually come through for her. Now, I won't spoil the movie, but there are some people and programs that do end up being of service. But what's most striking about this movie is how long this trauma was able to go on in this girl's life with basically no one knowing or caring because there are entire swaths of people in this country Obviously the fact that they are very poor, but it compounded by the fact that they are a black family that we sort of write off and are comfortable with allowing to uh, experience all kinds of trauma and marginalization that we wouldn't allow for other people. This movie is a tough watch. There is no doubt about it. It is a really, really, it's like an endurance test. It is difficult to watch. Not as much as another movie I'm gonna talk about, but I do think it's worth watching kind of like bearing witness to because as, extreme as some of the things that you see in this movie might be, it's important to remember that there are children and teenagers all over the country every day who are going through this and worse. Lightening things up a bit is Everything Everywhere All at Once, which I think is a lot of our favorite to win Best Picture this year. This one was directed by The Daniels, aka Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert. This movie is basically impossible to describe because it's so outside of the norms of typical genre and storytelling, which I think is 
absolutely to its credit. It's one of the most unique and fun and enjoyable movies that I've seen at the theater in years. But what is really striking about this movie is the fact that it's sort of like at its core, it's an action fantasy movie, but that totally centers around a working class family and more importantly, integrates the aspects of struggling with being on the margins of the lower working class and poverty into the fantastical and action packed elements. So for example, a lot of the movie centers around you know having to pay a really onerous tax bill or the day-to-day -day drudgery of running a struggling laundromat or not having enough money to pay for basic things. Oftentimes I think in movies we typically separate out things that are fun and entertaining and escapism and things that are serious and tough and need to be dealt with and they're in two totally separate categories of movies. So I think it only enhances and um, adds a real level of investment to the action happening in a movie when you really believe that these are real people who are struggling with real issues. Um, so if you haven't seen it, definitely give this movie a watch, but also we need more movies that are both fantastical and deeply realistic, which for most American families means dealing with money problems. Now we gotta go all the way back down in terms of tone to the probably most brutal movie I've ever watched. Um, and that's Tyrannosaur, directed by Patty Considine. Have you seen this? Mm -hmm. So it stars Olivia Coleman um, in the most heart-wrenching, difficult performance I think I've ever seen. The fact that she didn't win an Oscar for this is bananas. Like I've never seen an, a, a performance that's more affecting. And I don't want to spoil too much about this movie. Um, suffice to say, it's about two people dealing with extreme trauma and grief and abuse who kind of come together um, to you know provide support for each other to provide kind of an oasis for each other um, but the class issues visible in this movie the ways in which poverty intersects with and compounds the various problems that they're experiencing the way um, that for example not having financial resources will keep you in extremely violent or dangerous situations, perpetuate the cycle of addiction, perpetuate the cycle of abuse. Like the way that these things are represented in Tyrannosaur, I've never, I've rarely seen represented as well in a movie. Um, and I have to say like Olivia Coleman's performance in this is like probably one of the best performances I've ever seen an actor give ever. Like there are scenes where she's very upset where like you, it, you just truly believe that you're watching a real person have a moment. Like you are totally out of the movie. You're out of like, disbelief is so suspended that it is like on the ceiling. Like you are in it and it is very difficult to watch. I think this one more than any of the other movies on this list deserves some heavy trigger warnings. Um, but I definitely think it's massively worth watching. Lastly, to lighten things up a tiny bit is Lady Bird, directed by Greta Gerwig. So this is a movie that many of us have seen and loved. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. I think that not since Roseanne, and I think it's not a coincidence that um, it stars one of the former stars of Roseanne, um, have we seen a representation of being a lower middle class um, you know, teenager going into young adult um, who's having to navigate the particular, you know, difficulties of being a smart, ambitious, creative, you know, curiously minded kid who has a lot of limitations imposed on them by social class. And this movie doesn't deal with outright poverty in the way that some do, but it does deal with the very, very frustrating and kind of in some ways self-defeating limitations that, you know, money can impose on a family. You know, you may not be able to go to the great school that you got into. You may not be able to uh, afford to buy new clothes for a special event or an interview or an opportunity. You may not afford to be able to do the things that are so easy for the people around you. And when you're a teenager who is on that side of the class equation and you're often around teenagers who are, you know, upper middle class, class who don't have these same issues, it can create a very specific kind of shame and embarrassment and um, need to kind of hide yourself and lie that I think really resonates with a lot of teenagers. It's certainly resonated with me. Um, 
a lot of the scenes of her like being embarrassed, you know, having to buy thrift store clothes and, you know, uh, you know having to not being able to do certain things that she was qualified for, um, I think are really, really powerful and not enough movies uh, kind of deal with these issues. And it's also just a really fun, funny, enjoyable movie that's quite a bit lighter than a lot of the rest of the movies on this list. So that is my list, my top 10, um, again, in no specific order, but I think all of these movies really deal with class and poverty and uh, you know social issues in a really powerful way. I think they're all massively worth watching and um, all of them, only very, very, very few of them actually got their due when it came time for awards. So always go into award season with heavy skepticism because very rarely are some of the most important stories being told, the ones that we're celebrating. And now it's time for me to answer the two society questions of the video. As a reminder, uh, click the join button below to become a member of our amazing society. You get tons of awesome perks and exclusives and bonus stuff. Um, but you also get to ask me questions that I answer every month, like a little mailbag. What is the mail song from Blue's Clues? We just got a letter. We just got a question from our little members. Wonder what they said. Okay. <laughs> this person says, I loved your recent TikTok, thank you, about refusing to feel busy. Thoughts on how you practically work on that mindset while leading a full life, pushing yourself to do challenging slash fulfilling things that you don't need to do, etc. Okay, so I'll link the TikTok in the description for anyone who's curious, but basically the point that I was making is that I do have a pretty full calendar, but I never ever really feel busy or consider myself busy. Now, a lot of that is a privilege, right? Like I work a four day work week. I don't have children. Like I definitely have a life that is more adapted to flexibility and free time than others. But I actually like on paper have a fairly stacked schedule, but I really try to make the distinction as I make in the video between things that I am choosing to take on and things that are out of my control. And I find that the feeling of busyness, what we're often describing, and you know, part of the issue is our constant cultural obsession with seeming busy, which can be a status symbol and a power move and all of these other things. But I think it's often really important to distinguish things that we're kind of burdening ourselves with versus the things that we're opting into. And my goal is always to reduce the things that are burdensome, that are, you know, maybe it's redundant work, maybe it's, um, you know, something that I should outsource, maybe it's something that I shouldn't be doing anymore, like things that are out of my control or that are really being imposed on me where maybe I even could improve my own efficiency with regards to a task like when we move to the four day work week uh, versus things that I'm choosing to take on and which I consider a privilege and a luxury to be able to do, um, whether it's hobbies or seeing friends or taking on a side project or doing home renovations. All of these things are ultimately they should only be additive to your life. And if they are compounding a feeling of, oh, I'm so busy, I'm so overwhelmed, then that's the problem to be identified rather than just having a calendar that happens to be full. So my best advice is to try on a regular basis to do a real inventory of your life, uh, especially if you do feel busy or overwhelmed, and try to, to identify as many of these things as possible that either you could do differently um, that you don't have to be doing and are sort of imposing on yourself. Um, things that are more about outward perception than inner, you know, fulfillment and joy. And to really separate out in your mind the things that are um, ultimately privileges and things that you're opting into versus the things that are actually causing that real burden. Another person says, how do you feel about the increasing number of layoffs in the U.S. tech industry? as compared to other countries in Europe where workers and employees seem to be better protected. My answer to this or any question like this is yes, America needs uh, better labor protections desperately. Um, looking at doing things like unionizing in your own workplace, sharing salaries, um, communicating with other people in your industry, practicing transparency. Um, these are all the best things that you can do on an individual level. Um, but there is absolutely no doubt about it, even though in many cases tech workers are a more privileged class of workers than others in the United States, they are still, like all American workers, woefully underprotected when it comes to, um, you know, their long term employment, their retirement, their, you know, medical care, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, it's bad, man. And we got to have less of it and emulate other countries that do this way better, even for the most privileged workers among us. But as always, guys, thank you for watching and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and to come back every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday for new and awesome videos. Bye.